Hi, welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Dr. William Vaughn with the Good Samaritan Health Network here in Vincennes, Indiana. We're going to be talking about treatment of BPH, especially concentrating on the new procedure called the Eurolift. So I'm happy to join you today, and if you have questions, you can send those questions in, and we'll try to answer those as we go along. Today we're going to talk about BPH, which stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is a benign growth that occurs in men as they age. We'll discuss how it's diagnosed and what treatment options. So to review the anatomy, the bladder sits here, the prostate sits below it with the channel coming out through. It surrounds the urethra. Uh, it's primarily a sexual uh, organ uh, that aids in ejaculation for fertility. Here's another side view with the bladder and the prostate sitting behind the pubic bone, which is right here. If we look straight on, we have the ureters coming from the kidney into the bladder where the urine is uh, stored. When you urinate, it comes out through the bladder neck, through the prostate, on out through your channel. And when you're young, the prostate is very small and the prostate starts to enlarge really when you start to get into your 30s and 40s. And then as you age, that prostate enlargement will progress so that most symptoms start to occur in the late 40s and 50s and progresses as you get older and the size of the prostate gets bigger. There are other diseases of the prostate that can cause symptoms Prostatitis is an infectious process that will sometimes swell the prostate and cause difficulty urinating. Prostate cancer, which a lot of you are aware of, uh, oftentimes doesn't cause symptoms until it's more advanced. Uh, we find prostate cancer through screenings with digital rectal exams and PSAs. And then the prostate enlargement is what we refer to as BPH. Again, as you get older through the 50s, 60s, and above, the number of men that are bothered by the symptoms significantly increases. So by the time you're in your late 70s and 80s, almost 90% of men will have some kind of prostate obstructive symptoms. So BPH is just a term for an enlargement of the prostate. That enlargement usually occurs on the inside of the prostate surrounding the channel, and because of that, the channel is affected, causing the blockage. Now, if you see a, a normal appearing bladder, the inside is very smooth, kind of like the inside of your cheek, very smooth. The prostate has a channel to void through, so there's no blockage when you're young. But as you get older, and the inside of the prostate starts to enlarge, that requires a lot more pressure from the bladder to try to force urine out through the prostate blockage. And we develop what we call trabeculation, which is thickening of the bladder wall and a lot of muscle bands that look like this. So when we put a scope into the bladder, we wanna see a nice smooth bladder. Men that have significant blockage the bladder's having to work extra hard to force the urine out, and just like you go out and lift weights to make your arms look bigger, the bladder, which is a muscle, will also thicken to try to force that urine out. Eventually, then, that can cause damage to the bladder, and the bladder can decompensate. So this is looking at the bladder through a scope, and you can see these little pockets that are starting to form, these big muscle bands, Again, this is a significant damage to the bladder, even to the point that with a high pressure, you can have these little pop-off valves that form, and these are called diverticula. So when that's a high pressure system, when you urinate, some of the urine goes into the pocket instead of coming out through the channel. This is a, a bad problem for the bladder and can cause a lot of infectious problems. Now the other thing that we oftentimes see in patients that have prostate blockage and retention of urine would be the development of bladder stones. The calcium in the urine will settle to the bottom and will form a stone. This is an x-ray of a stone in the bladder and here is the, 
a stone with a penny next to it to show you how large those bladder stones can become. We have to operate on these using a laser to try to break the stones up and flush them out. So as the disease progresses with a normal prostate, through the scope you can see here's the prostate, but you can look through and there's an opening without any blockage. As that progresses you can start to see the prostate grow into the channel and then on the men that we operate for the Urolift you can see the two lobes actually come together like gates closing to completely block the channel. So what kind of symptoms do you develop when you have prostate blockage? Frequency of urination is very common. So instead of being able to wait three hours to urinate, some people have to go at an hour to hour and a half. Getting up at nighttime is one of the biggest complaints because people lose sleep. A sudden urge to urinate with leakage on the way to the bathroom is common. Or other patients get to the bathroom and have to stand and wait and wait and wait to get it primed. The urinary flow significantly reduces. So when you're young and you can pee over a fence, now you have to pee under the fence and keep it off your shoes. Incomplete emptying is common and what we call intermittency, which means you start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. So how does this affect you? Well, it's Thanksgiving time. A lot of people want to travel some people are afraid to travel because they're going to have to stop every little bit to go to the bathroom. They get to the family's house, they have urgency, they have leakage, and they're embarrassed by it. So then they decide they don't want to travel anymore. It interrupts activities going out with friends because same thing, they don't want to go to a restaurant and be constantly getting up and going back and forth. This is your urologist. Dr. Grossfinger. So the enlarged prostate diagnosis. First and most important would be the symptom evaluation. When you come in, we have a questionnaire that we have you answer questions about your symptoms, and it gives us an idea of the severity of the problem. The physical exam would include evaluation of your kidneys and your abdomen. We do a bladder scan, which is a simple ultrasound test of your bladder to see how much urine is retained within the bladder after you have completed urination. And we do a digital rectal exam to measure the prostate size and also to check for any nodules that could be consistent with prostate cancer. The AUA symptom score is the, what I mentioned that gives us a number to evaluate the severity. And then we ask you quality of life question, how much of a bother is it to you? The digital rectal exam is performed like this. When we go in through the rectum, the prostate, we can feel the backside of the prostate. And a lot of prostate cancers, <clears throat> we can palpate on examination. So we wanna make sure that the prostate feels of normal consistency. If we suspect prostate cancer, then we do a completely different evaluation. We also want to evaluate for the size of the prostate because there are some limitations on how we do that. They even do these exams sometimes on the soccer field. <clears throat> so the AUA symptom score, again, we have a question, uh, seven questions from zero to five, and you can see how we score those combination of symptoms. A lot of men in my office come in with severe symptoms with a score of 20 to 35. So what kind of options do we have? Watchful waiting, meaning we don't do anything. When you first start to develop the symptoms, they may not be that bothersome. Maybe you start getting up once a night. You kind of adapt to that. Maybe you have to go a little bit more frequently and the flow is not quite as good. So you're not ready to do anything, which is fine. The second option would be medication. And we have two different lines of medicines that we use, one of which will help to shrink the prostate and one of which will help to open the prostate to let the urine come out more freely. Now, all medicines have potential side effects, so we have to take that into account whenever we start medication. We have heat-based therapies where we try to heat the prostate Microwave therapy was a very common one when it 
uh, first came out, but was not very successful and we've kind of gotten away from that. And what we still consider the gold standard surgery is a TURP, which is where we go in through the channel and we resect the prostate or core out the prostate, what a lot of people commonly refer to as getting reamed out. <clears throat> so advantages of, of both, well, watch for waiting, you just have to put up with the symptoms. Medications, you may have side effects, you may have uh, cost involved. The disadvantage with watchful waiting is you're going to have to keep putting up with your symptoms. Advantage of medication is no surgery. The disadvantage, you have to take it daily for the rest of your life. You have potential side effects and the cost involved of taking the medicine. Herbal remedy, I'm not in favor. Uh, a lot of people take salt palmetto. The studies that the, the urologic community has done with sal palmetto indicate that that does not provide any benefit. Um, I think that some people get a placebo benefit so they think they're better, but the statistics show that it's not actually a benefit. <clears throat> the advantage of the heat-based therapy was we can do it in the office. Uh, fewer side effects than surgery, but unfortunately, there's a high retreatment rate. And then with the TUR of the prostate, which is the gold standard again, great procedure. The downside is you have to have a general anesthetic or a spinal anesthetic. You normally have to stay in the hospital overnight. You have to have a catheter at least overnight and sometimes longer. Um, Erectile problems are not very common, but you do lose the ability for ejaculation because the bladder neck is affected and you develop what's called retrograde ejaculation where the semen will go back into the bladder. This is uh, what patients in my office look like when I just mentioned the word catheter. So the Urolift system, this is new. Uh, we've been doing it here at Good Samaritan Hospital for over a year and a half. I think this has revolutionized how I treat prostate disease, and I'm very, very excited about this. Um, we have been doing this uh, about a year and a half, and we have a designation of being a center of excellence for this procedure. There are only two of those in the state of Indiana, uh, and so we're very proud of that. The advantage, we can do this as an outpatient, local anesthetic with a little sedation. The vast majority of patients go home without a catheter. Um, rarely does anybody have to spend the night. Disadvantages, following the procedure for the first three or four days, there may be some intermittent bleeding. Urgency and urgency incontinence are common just for the first three or four days and then that improves. And some mild discomfort but I have not had to give anybody any kind of narcotics for this as usually ibuprofen will take care of it. So the way this procedure works, <clears throat> again, the bladder's sitting up high, prostate sits below it, and we have a scope that goes up through the prostate. We compress the tissue, we put an implant in with one tab that goes on the outside of the prostate, one tab that goes on the inside, and we do that on both sides, anywhere from two implants up to a maximum of six, depending on the length of the prostate. At the end, you can see how the channel has been opened up by pulling the prostate apart. This, the implant that we use, the tab that goes on the outside of the prostate is nitinol. The tab that goes on the inside of the prostate, in, in the inside we call the lumen, is stainless steel and there's a suture. When we compress the tissue, then we adjust the suture that holds the prostate open. So let me play this video that kind of shows how the procedure works.
tissue is being compressed, the needle fires through the prostate, delivering the implant on the outside, and then the implant on the inside. So you can see how when you put in the implants, it opens everything up. So, when we have finished with the implant, this is a picture before the surgery where the prostate lobes have come together to block the channel. We like to take the picture at the same point. This is called the virium montanum of the prostates. We like to take the picture there showing the blockage. Here's the virium montanum. One of the prostate lobes is pulled out here, the other is pulled out here, so now you have a big channel that opens up in order to urinate. So, <clears throat> I usually see patients back two weeks following the surgery. Patients normally complain the first three or four days of having some minor discomfort, maybe some leakage and a little bit of bleeding, none of which are usually bad problems. But at the two week mark, almost all of my patients have already seen a significant improvement in their symptoms. I see them back at two or three months after that, and again, we still continue to see improvement in symptoms when they return. This is an older slide. The, um, when, when I got these slides, it was four years. We're up to about six years now. And the data is still very good at six years for patients that have had this procedure. We see uh, about 87% of patients are very pleased with the procedure. 13% of patients end up may have to have something else done, either a different type of procedure, or some patients that have a weak bladder, and we try to get them opened up with the Urolift procedure, may continue to have difficulty urinating just because their bladder is not strong enough to work, and they may end up having to use a catheter on a long-term basis. Before I would commit that patient to a long-term catheter, I'd prefer to try this procedure because a lot of patients will end up being able to empty adequately where they don't have to use the catheter. But some patients that have waited too long to have this procedure, as I showed you from the pictures, the muscle bands, uh, the bladder starts to decompress, and they wait too long to have this done, then they end up having to use a catheter on a long-term basis. So I would encourage anybody that has symptoms of blockage, uh, we'd be happy to see you have you come to the office, we can talk with you, we can explain the procedure, we can do an exam. To evaluate patients for the Urolift, we mentioned the bladder scan that we do in the office. I also will do a scope of the bladder to make sure that we see the visual obstruction. We evaluate the bladder at that time for the thickness, how well you're emptying. We do a flow study, so we actually fill your bladder with water and we have you urinate and we measure the flow rate because we know what the normal flow rate is. We use the flow study to help determine the severity of the obstruction. Uh, there is one limitation, which is a prostate larger than 80 grams. So if we have a patient that has a really large prostate, we would then add a volume study, which is a prosthetic ultrasound probe that we put into the rectum to measure the size of the prostate. If it's over 80 grams, then by the FDA, we are not able to do this procedure and we have to pick a different procedure. Otherwise, if the prostate is under that size um, and you have significant blockage, then this procedure would probably provide a significant improvement in your symptoms. So if you are interested in the procedure, you can call my office, 812-882-4320. Uh, uh, tell my office staff that you are interested in uh, seeing me for evaluation of the Urolift procedure, and we'll be glad to get you in and talk to you and your family about this and set up the evaluation. Thank you.